In The Haunter in the Dark, Robert Blake, a writer fascinated by the occult, investigates a sinister, abandoned church in Providence linked to the mysterious Starry Wisdom cult. Within, he discovers an ancient artifact, the Shining Trapezohedron, which serves as a gateway to a cosmic entity known as the Haunter of the Dark. As Blake delves deeper, his curiosity unleashes the entity, leading to a chilling confrontation with forces beyond human comprehension. And now we begin. The prudent among you will balk at the telling, for such men are wont to seek shelter in the confines of reason. And there is little of reason in the account of Robert Blake. They will say he was struck down by the caprice of lightning, or by some convulsion of the flesh wrought by an errant surge of nature's blind electric force. True, the glass that stood before him bore no mark of rupture, Yet who among us has not seen nature in her derangements? Who has not borne witness to her unwieldy theater? The grimace affixed to his countenance may as well have been some trick of sinew and tendon, unrelated to the dread he sought to name. His ledger, too, they will dismiss, branding it the fever work of a mind ensnared by local legend and the moldy fables he had unearthed in his unseemly zeal. And as for the queer doings in that abandoned temple atop Federal Hill, those that are sly in their logic will speak of hoaxes and delusions, perhaps unwittingly abetted by the man himself. For Blake, they say, was a seeker of the grotesque. He walked in dreams and shadows and culled his sustenance from the night's unlit corners. His brushes and his pen were pledged to the service of things misshapen and spectral, and he roamed the forgotten places of the earth with the fervor of a moth drawn to its own immolation. That he was drawn once more to this city of dread, to that blackened steeple where the wind's howls spoke in a dialect of ruin, is no mystery to them. They will say he sought it, that he yearned for it. And if his death snuffed out the embers of some great deception, some monstrous fraud destined to endure in letters, they count it no great loss. Yet there are others who will not be swayed by these reasoned conclusions. They take the ledger for what it claims to be, and they point to the certainties buried among the conjecture. The records of that old, loathed sect the starry wisdom are genuine, as is the tale of the reporter Lillibridge, whose inquiries ended in silence and dissolution. They point, too, to the horror stamped upon Blake's visage, that mask of awe and terror, as of a man who has looked upon something unendurable. And among these believers there was one, a doctor learned and upright, who hurled into the sea the strange artifact pried from that black steeple a box of unearthly angles that seemed to bend light and reason alike. He swore he had banished from the earth a thing too dreadful to abide, though his act was met with the scorn of authorities and the derision of his peers. So it is that the tale cleaves into two paths, one paved with the bricks of skepticism, the other winding into shadowed places where reason dare not tread. The chronicles of the day have laid bare the facts, but it is left to you, the reader, to walk where you will. What you see in Blake's diary, truth, madness, or cunning deceit, will color the story's hues to your liking. Yet to peer closely into those pages, to parse their words in the cold light of dispassion, is to risk the unraveling of your own certainties for the path ahead is dark, and the actor's tale is one of descent into what realm it is not ours to know. Young Blake came to Providence in the frost-bound months of 1934, laying claim to a sunlit chamber in the upper story of a weathered house nestled within a green enclave off College Street. The hill upon which it stood rose eastward, 
with the quiet majesty of age, its slopes crowned by the august edifices of Brown University, while below the marble symmetry of the John Hay Library glimmered with winter light. It was a place of calm antiquity, where time seemed to pool and eddy. A small garden court sheltered from the world's more brash advances, its quiet sanctity guarded by lounging cats who dozed on a shed roof dappled with pale sun. The house itself was of Georgian persuasion, its roof marked by a monitor crest like the pilot house of some ancient vessel. The fan-carved doorway yawned beneath lintels of a bygone age, and the windows framed their panes in leaded glass that fractured the day into curious geometries. Inside, the relics of another century persisted. Doors thick and paneled, floors wide planked and heavy with the grain of slow-grown trees, staircases whose curves seemed the embodiment of some forgotten craftsman's quiet joy. Blake took for his study a room in the southwest corner, whose windows embraced the garden below on one side, and on the other surveyed the lower sprawl of the city from the brow of the hill. The desk there, positioned to drink in the western light, bore silent witness to sunsets of unearthly splendor as the roofs of the town lay in silhouette against the dying fires of the sun, beyond the nearer precincts of slate and chimney. Beyond the pale stretch of countryside on the horizon, there loomed the spectral outline of Federal Hill, a bristling expanse of clustered gables and steeped steeples that seemed to waver and distort beneath the drifting veils of smoke that rose from the city's unseen hearths. There were moments when the hill seemed less a thing of stone and timber than some evanescent dreamscape, a half-glimpsed world afloat upon the ether, as though Blake's eye might pierce it, should he ever seek its hidden streets in the flesh. It was here, amid these surroundings, that Blake set about his solitary work. He summoned to his quarters the books that had nourished him in distant Milwaukee and adorned the space with furnishings of the old world's aspect, whose presence seemed to root the house more deeply in its soil. His labor was both in words and in paint. In a north-facing attic room, beneath the crystalline light that poured through the monitor roof, he conjured landscapes, not of this earth, and forms that bore no likeness to any living thing. That first winter was a season of prolific creation. Stories of strange burrowers and cryptic stairways, tales of realms called Shagai and Nath, and visions of feasters beneath alien stars. His canvases, too, bore witness to the otherworldly, Scenes of desolation and of cosmic horror, alive with the unnameable and the monstrous. Each evening as the day waned, Blake would seat himself before his westward window, his gaze drawn as if by compulsion to the outspread roofs below and the far mound of Federal Hill, now half consumed by the lowering light. Beneath him the darkened towers of Memorial Hall, the clock-spired courthouse, and the scattered pinnacles of the downtown quarter took on the semblance of a sunken city half lost to shadow. But always his gaze returned to the hill, to that shimmering rise that seemed less of the town than an apparition born from some unseen gulf. Through his field glasses he would peer, his vision picking out steeples and chimneys as though their forms might yield some secret and yet no clarity came, only a deepening sense of estrangement, as though the hill was a thing not meant for the eye's full reckoning. Its streets, its labyrinths, its very existence seemed tethered to some dream of his own conjuring, as though the city and the stories he birthed were wound together by threads of a singular and otherworldly fabric. Even as twilight fell and the courthouse lamps burned cruel and bright in the deepening dark, even as the great red beacon of the industrial trust rose like some infernal star above the town, Blake's thoughts lingered on that place, that spectral slope that whispered to him across the veil of distance, 
promising something wondrous or terrible should he ever draw too near. Among all the strange forms that rose from the spectral mound of Federal Hill, it was the church, immense and brooding, that gripped Blake's eye with a singular force. Its darkened mass loomed out of the tangled sea of ridgepoles and chimneys, a black monolith that caught the failing light of day and held it fast. At sunset, the steeple speared the burning sky like a black blade, its grim silhouette etched against the infernal glow. The church perched upon a high crest, its weathered stone facade and slant-roofed flank rising boldly over the rooftops about it, the pointed arch of its tall windows like hollow sockets staring into eternity. The stone was ancient, darkened by decades of smoke and storm, a surface alive with the corrosions of time. Through his field glass, Blake discerned in its contours the faint relics of an older world, an embryonic Gothic, not yet soaring, still captive to the classical sensibilities of the Georgian age. It must have been raised in those tentative years around 1810, when builders were but experimenting with the style. As the months unspooled and winter seeded to the chill clarity of spring, Blake's fixation deepened. The church had long stood vacant. This much he knew from the lifeless expanse of its windows, dark and unmoving in all seasons. Yet the vacancy seemed not merely material. He began to sense, or to imagine, a peculiar desolation about the place. No bird ever alighted on its eaves, though pigeons and sparrows wheeled freely about the other steeples of the city. It was a thing noted first by chance, and then with growing certainty. He would scour the air with his glass, tracking the shadows of wings, and see the flocks turn always away, as if drawn by some mute aversion. He spoke of this to his friends, pointing out the tower's blackened stone, but none had ever ventured to Federal Hill, nor could say what history the structure bore. It was a mystery even in a city steeped in forgotten things. The spring thaw brought a restlessness upon him, like the stirrings of some buried instinct clawing upward through the loam of his reason. His novel, an ambitious work that sought to weave the old witch haunts of Maine into the tapestry of the present, lay stagnant upon his desk, the pages yellowing as his pen remained unmoved. His thoughts, as though drawn by unseen wires, strayed always westward to the dark steeple and the fogged gables of the hill. The earth itself bloomed with life, the boughs in the garden burgeoning with tender green, yet Blake could take no joy in it. The season's beauty, with its promise of renewal, served only to heighten the ache within him. He thought now, for the first time of crossing the city, of leaving the familiar for that veiled incline where shadows and smoke wove a tapestry of dream. Late in April, as the ancient rhythms of Walpurgis drew near, Blake set forth to breach the unseen frontier. His steps carried him through the labyrinth of the city, its endless streets arrayed like corridors in some vast sepulchre. The squares and avenues stretched on, weary with age and neglect, their porches sagging under the weight of years, their windows clouded with grime. At last he came to the base of the hill, where the avenue rose steeply between rows of crumbling facades, the stairs here were pitted and worn smooth, their Doric balustrades listing, their stone steps stained by the tread of countless feet, now long turned to dust. The crowd about him thickened, dark faces moving like shadows in the dusk. Foreign signs jutted from the walls above shops with strange goods arrayed behind smeared panes, the buildings leaning together like conspirators in the gloaming. Yet the world he sought was not here. He found no church, no spire, no arching Gothic windows, 
only an unfamiliar strangeness that neither matched nor contradicted what he had seen from afar. The federal hill of his long observation, its smoke-wreathed mystery, seemed to retreat with each step he took, as though it lay not upon this earth but in some other realm beyond the reach of mortal passage. Blake moved among the drifting shapes of that foreign quarter, the air heavy with scents and murmurs unknown to him, and felt the faint yet growing certainty that the hill as he had imagined it, as he had dreamed it, could never be reached by waking feet. It was a place of phantoms, of mist and half-light, whose true streets and contours remained as elusive as the stuff of dreams. The streets turned labyrinthine as Blake climbed, and the city grew stranger with each step. Now and then the grim remnants of a church facade or the jagged outline of a spire would rise against the clouds, but never did he find the blackened tower he sought. He questioned a shopkeeper about a great stone church, a man whose face bore the rough texture of the immigrant quarter. And though the man answered in clean, careful English, he only smiled and shook his head. Yet as Blake pressed onward, crossing wide avenues and delving into brown alleys that seemed to multiply endlessly toward the south, he began to sense the weight of something unseen, a shadowy tension lurking beneath the surface. Another merchant, when asked, seemed to flinch at Blake's words, his eyes darting to the side as though pursued by some invisible watcher. The man's face tightened in fear, poorly hidden, and his hand moved involuntarily to form a gesture Blake did not know. A warding sign, perhaps, or a plea to powers unnamed. The streets closed in further, their walls leaning inward as if to swallow him. And then at last, through the mists of the twisting alleys, the spire emerged, dark and stark against the churning sky. It rose over a dense thicket of rooftops, its edges blurred by distance, yet unmistakable in its brooding malevolence. Blake knew at once that he had found it. He plunged toward the black tower with an urgency that belied the oppression of the streets. The lanes were narrow and unpaved, their walls slick with grime and shadowed by the overhang of jutting balconies. Twice he lost his way, the alleys bending back upon themselves in a mocking geometry. The faces he passed, aged patriarchs bent in silence, mothers on stoops nursing infants, children shrieking as they kicked at the muddy ground, seemed to regard him with a wary stillness, as though sensing the strange purpose that drove him. Yet he dared not stop to ask directions, feeling in his marrow that the words would not come, that the place he sought was not spoken of in this realm of the living. At last, as the lanes fell away, the tower revealed itself fully, and Blake emerged into an open square cobbled unevenly with ancient stones. A high retaining wall rose at the far side, holding aloft a plateau whose overgrown surface bore the unmistakable silhouette of the church. The iron railings that topped the wall were rusted and overrun with weeds, and a padlocked gate at the head of a crumbling stair barred the way forward. Yet Blake needed no further confirmation, for the massive stone edifice that brooded atop the rise was the very thing that had haunted his long observations. Its great bulk rose from the plateau like a fossilized giant, dark and decrepit, an artifact of some forgotten epoch. The church stood in ruinous silence. Stone buttresses leaned where they had not yet fallen, their fractured forms half subsumed by creeping vegetation. The pointed finials that had once crowned its heights lay scattered in the weeds broken spires jutting from the earth like gravestones. The high Gothic windows, their sooty panes miraculously intact, despite the ravages of time and the malice of idle hands, stared blankly into the empty square below. 
The great doors, massive and unyielding, remained closed as if in defiance of intrusion. Around the place hung a pall of desolation, a sense of disuse so profound it seemed almost malevolent. No ivy softened the stark black of the stone. No birds rested on the eaves. It was a place shunned by the living and the natural world alike. Few souls moved in the square, their shapes drifting through the haze like specters. But at the northern edge, Blake saw a policeman in blue, a towering man with a ruddy Irish face. To him, Blake turned, though the act felt fraught, as though to speak of the church aloud was to transgress some unspoken boundary. The officer regarded him with a deep and wary gravity, his genial demeanor faltering at the mention of the building. He made the sign of the cross with a hand that trembled faintly and muttered something about the silence that surrounded that place the silence enforced by those who knew its history. Pressed further, the man admitted almost reluctantly that the Italian priests had long warned of it, their sermons laced with admonitions to keep clear of its shadow. They said some monstrous presence had dwelt there once, a thing of profound and ancient evil that had seeped into the very stones. His father, the officer said, had whispered of it in his youth, of sounds that should not have been, of rumors that spread like poison through the streets of the old city. The church bore the mark of something long past, yet never gone, its malignance lingering like a stain on the earth. The officer spoke in the low tones of one recounting forbidden lore. His voice touched with the weight of things better left unsaid. There had been, he said, a sect in the old days, a dark order outlawed even by the reckless libertines of their time. These were men who trafficked in what they ought not, who called forth horrors from a gulf beyond reckoning, creatures summoned from the abyssal night to walk the waking world. It had taken a priest, Father O'Malley, a man of strength and prayer, to cast back what had risen though there were whispers that it was not the priest but the light itself that banished the unclean. Now Father O'Malley was long dead, and the tales of that time had withered into hushed anecdotes shared by the old and fearful. Best to leave it alone, the officer said. The sect was gone, scattered like rats from a sinking ship when the storm of suspicion broke in 1877. Vanishings had stirred the town to murmurs then, and the church's keepers had fled, leaving behind only the blackened husk of their sanctuary. Time and the city's indifference had left the property untended, a ruin set adrift in the tides of memory. Someday, perhaps, the officials would seize it, claim it for the coffers of the state in lieu of heirs, long vanished or dead. But who would dare touch it? Who would stir the dust of that place? Better to let it stand and fall for the earth to reclaim its stones than to disturb what lingered, silent but watchful, beneath its shadow. When the policeman took his leave, Blake remained, his gaze pinned to the towering mass before him. The old words of the officer, strange and half-spoken, lingered in his mind an echo that mingled with his own fancies. The tales of the church seemed not so unlike the stories Blake himself had spun from his pen. Yet here they stood clothed in the weight of reality, or at least in the shared dread of those who lived in the shadow of its steeple. The afternoon sun, breaking through dispersing clouds, threw its light across the city. Yet it seemed to falter as it touched the church, the sooty walls absorbed the light without reflection, their surface dull and unyielding, as if the very stone rejected the caress of spring. The yard within the iron fence, too, resisted the season's renewal. The brown weeds lay matted and dead, the ground untouched by the verdant flush of April, as though some invisible blight hung in the air. Blake found himself drawing closer,
his feet moving unbidden as though compelled by the very malignance of the place. He studied the rusting fence and the stone embankment, seeking a way through, and at last found it. A gap in the bars on the north side, near the edge of the overgrown plateau. He could climb the steps and edge along the fence until he reached the breach, slipping inside without notice from the wary souls below. If the people feared the church as deeply as it seemed, no one would stop him. He mounted the embankment and passed within the fence almost unnoticed, but as he glanced back, he saw the square behind him had changed. The few figures in the open were retreating, moving away with furtive glances and hurried gestures. From the windows, faces vanished, shutters drawn in sudden haste. A woman darted into the street, clutching children to her as she disappeared into a leaning, paintless house. All who remained made the same sign with their right hands, the curious gesture Blake had seen before, as if shielding themselves from his actions, or from what they feared he might awaken. Within the yard, the decay was profound. The earth clutched at his boots with the tangled grasp of dead weeds, and here and there the stumps of ancient headstones jutted from the soil like broken teeth. Blake's steps grew hesitant as he approached the church itself. The closer he came, the more its sheer scale overwhelmed him. The facade rose before him, a monolith of weathered stone, its buttresses like the ribs of some primordial beast. He forced himself onward, testing the great doors at the front, but each was locked, the iron fittings cold and immovable beneath his hands. Undeterred, he began a slow circuit of the church, probing its base for any weakness, any forgotten portal. The building loomed above him, a cyclopean edifice of shadow and ruin, its details obscured by the creeping twilight of its own aura. He could not tell whether he truly wished to enter the place, his hand sought away in almost of its own accord, but in his mind there warred a dread that deepened with every step. Yet the strangeness of the place, the pull of its nameless secrets, was irresistible. Something awaited within, he knew. Not salvation, not peace, but an answer, perhaps, to a question he dared not even frame. Blake found his ingress at the rear of the church, where a cellar window gaped in neglect, its frame warped and unguarded. He crouched before it, peering into the dim recess beyond, and saw the shrouded remnants of another time. Dust lay thick upon the concrete floor, muting every contour beneath a pall of gray, while faint sunlight slanted in from the west, fractured into pale shafts by the grime-streaked glass. Ruined barrels and splintered crates crouched among the debris, their purpose long eroded by time. Against the far wall, the corroded skeleton of a Victorian furnace slumped in rusting disrepair, a relic of an age when the church had known heat and care. His decision came almost without thought, as though his limbs obeyed some command not his own. Crawling through the window, he dropped into the cavernous gloom, his feet stirring motes of dust that swirled and danced in the fractured light. The cellar was vast, a single open expanse where shadows pooled in the far corners and the air hung heavy with decay. To his right, cloaked in denser blackness, yawned an arched doorway that seemed to lead upward into the heart of the building. The weight of the place settled upon him like a physical thing, yet he steeled himself against the rising unease. Spying a barrel still intact amid the ruin, he rolled it to the window to secure his retreat and turned toward the arch. The dust and cobwebs clung to him as he crossed the floor, their fragile threads breaking upon his shoulders as though the building resisted his intrusion. The staircase beyond the arch was of stone, worn smooth by the countless steps of feet now long stilled. He climbed slowly, 
his fingers groping along the walls where the shadows gathered thickest. Each step sent echoes into the black, faint sounds swallowed by the oppressive silence. A sharp turn brought him to a door, its surface pitted with age, and after fumbling with the ancient latch, he pushed it inward. The door gave onto a corridor dimly lit by the fading light, its walls lined with paneling gone soft with worms. The air here felt no less stale than the cellar below, and Blake moved swiftly, his curiosity warring with a growing unease. Room after room unfolded before him as he explored, each door yielding freely to his touch. He wandered through chambers where dust lay in strange dunes and drifts, through spaces long abandoned to shadow and neglect. At last he came to the colossal nave, and there his breath caught in his throat. The vastness of the space swallowed him, its high vaulted ceiling lost in webs of titanic scale, the ropes of silken filaments looping from column to column like the work of monstrous spiders. Dust lay in undisturbed layers across the box pews, the pulpit, and the altar itself, while the clustered Gothic columns rose like ancient trees from some primeval forest. The air here was heavy with the pall of twilight. The faint light of the waning sun filtering through the apsidal windows high above. The windows themselves were a thing of dread. Their once brilliant colors were choked with soot and filth, and the images they bore were half concealed, their meaning warped by obscurity. What Blake could discern unnerved him. A grotesque semblance of saints, whose faces bore expressions more suited to the condemned than the holy. One window depicted no figure at all, only a deep void coiled with spirals of faint luminosity, a pattern that seemed to writhe when viewed from the corner of the eye. Turning away, Blake let his gaze fall to the altar, and there his unease deepened into something colder. The cross above it, draped in cobwebs, was not the familiar symbol of redemption, but a more ancient and obscure design. Its looped form spoke of the crux ansata, the Ankh of old Egypt, a sign of life and power that predated the faith this place once claimed to serve. It loomed in the half-light, its meaning obscured but no less potent, a relic of something primordial and unfathomable that seemed to hang over the nave like a shadow of the unknowable. In a small vestry room hidden behind the apse, Blake found himself in a place more deeply freighted with dread than any he had yet encountered. Here, a rotting desk crouched beneath sagging shelves of books that reached to the mildewed ceiling, their pages disintegrating into filth and ruin. The air was foul with damp and the stench of slow decay, but it was not these things that sent a shudder through him. It was the titles. These were no ordinary books, but the black tomes of whispered legend, the forbidden volumes whose very existence most men would deny for fear of their implications. Blake had read some of these works himself, though their contents had seared his mind like brands. There was the Necronomicon, bound in some ancient Latin translation, its pages dripping with the forbidden lore of Alhazred's madness. There, too, was the Liber Ivonis, whose every word was a cipher to cosmic despair, and the Cultes de Gaulle, penned by the damned Comte d'Erlet in the shadow of his own gibbet. Von Junst's unaussprechlichen Kulten lurked like a predator among the shelves, and the ghastly de Vermi Mysterie of Ludwig Prinn offered its unholy revelations to any soul willing to risk perdition. But there were others whose names were less familiar. The Pinacotic Manuscripts, whispered of in shadowed corners, and the Book of Zian, said to predate the very stars. One crumbling volume bore no title at all, only sigils and symbols that Blake, versed in occult lore, 
recognized with a visceral revulsion. This place, he thought, had not been falsely maligned. Its walls bore witness to a malice older than time, a legacy of corruption that extended beyond the bounds of the human race, a force immeasurable and malign that had once made its home here. In the desk, among the ruined drawers, Blake found a small record book bound in decaying leather. Its pages were filled with cryptic inscriptions, lines of astronomical and alchemical symbols woven together in dense, unbroken patterns. The sun and moon, the planets, the signs of the zodiac, all the arcane shorthand of lost sciences were pressed into its brittle pages with a purpose Blake could not immediately divine. Yet the manuscript had the air of something waiting to be unraveled, its meaning clawing at the edges of understanding. He slipped it into his coat pocket, the weight of it a strange comfort, even as the shadows of the place pressed heavier upon him. Though tempted by the larger tomes, their bulk made them impossible to carry away unnoticed. He wondered as he turned from them how they had remained untouched for so long. Had no other intruder overcome the miasma of dread that enshrouded this place? Or had they come and fled, driven back by whatever presence lingered unseen? Leaving the vestry, Blake retraced his steps through the nave, his boots scuffing trails in the dust that had lain undisturbed for decades. At the vestibule, he paused before a door leading to a staircase, one he had marked as likely to bring him to the tower that had haunted his nights and days. His breath quickened as he began to climb. The stairway was a narrow, spiraling thing, its wooden treads creaking beneath his weight, its surfaces choked with the silk of spiderwork and the grime of years. The air grew staler with each step, the faint light of high, clouded windows offering only glimpses of the city's rooftops far below. He reached the top expecting bells, for the tower had every outward appearance of a belfry. But what he found was something else entirely. The chamber was dimly lit by four narrow lancet windows, their decayed louvers allowing shafts of pale light to mingle with the dust. In the center of the floor stood a pillar of stone, its surface carved with crude hieroglyphs whose shapes eluded understanding. The pillar bore the scars of hands, long dead, its incisions an alien language inscribed with purpose, both obscure and malign. Atop the pillar rested a metal box of strange design, its asymmetrical angles a defiance of reason. The lid lay open, and within the dust-choked interior, Blake saw an object, irregular and egg-like, its surface a faint sheen of something neither metal nor stone. Around the pillar, arranged in a broken circle, were seven high-backed chairs of Gothic aspect, their dark wood still largely intact despite the long decay of the room. Beyond these loomed seven colossal figures, their blackened forms carved of some crumbling plaster. They resembled no saint or prophet, but stood in eerie resemblance to the monoliths of Easter Island. Their enigmatic faces turned inward as if in eternal judgment of the room's grim centerpiece. In one shadowed corner of the chamber, a ladder rose along the wall to a trap door set in the ceiling, beyond which lay the steeple itself windowless and ominous in its isolation. The room was silent, but for the faint creak of the floorboards beneath Blake's feet and the stirring of the dust in the filtered light. Yet that silence bore the weight of watching, of something present but unseen, as though the very air conspired to hold its breath. As Blake's vision adjusted to the dim and filtered light of the tower chamber, his gaze returned to the peculiar box of yellowish metal that rested atop the incised pillar. The surface of the box was marked with bass reliefs, their forms monstrous and utterly alien. He bent to clear the dust from the engravings, 
first with his handkerchief and then with trembling fingers. The carvings revealed creatures of no known genus, entities that writhed with an unsettling vitality, yet bore no semblance to anything that had walked, swum, or flown upon this earth. They seemed alive, yet wholly other, their forms composed of geometries that defied natural law. As though they had been conjured from the fevered dreams of a mind unfettered by the constraints of terrestrial life. The object within the box, the one he had first taken for a sphere, revealed itself to be something more strange still. A dark polyhedron, streaked with bands of red and possessing a surface of irregular, polished facets. It lay not upon the base of the box, but was suspended by a peculiar mechanism. A metal band encircled its middle, supported by seven strange and intricate arms that extended to the inner walls of the box's upper corners. The construction suggested a purpose, both deliberate and enigmatic. Blake's fascination grew with every moment. The object seemed to draw his eyes as if by some magnetic pull, and as he gazed upon its gleaming surfaces, he fancied he could see through it, as though its depths contained windows into other realms. Within its crystalline interior floated visions of alien worlds, globes shrouded in storms, their surfaces marked by impossible towers of stone. Barren orbs cloaked in silence, their landscapes broken only by the lifeless peaks of vast, shadowy mountains. And still farther, realms of endless void, where blackness stirred with the faint pulse of consciousness, vast and inscrutable. At last, wrenching his gaze from the object, Blake's attention was drawn to a curious mound of dust in the far corner of the room near the ladder leading to the steeple above. It was not its size nor its placement that caught his eye, but rather something in the shape of it, something that tugged at the edge of recognition. Moving toward it, he swept aside the trailing cobwebs that hung like shrouds from the ceiling beams. As he drew closer, the contours resolved themselves into something unmistakably human. Kneeling, he began to uncover the truth, the dust falling away beneath his hands to reveal the remnants of a long-dead occupant. The skeletal remains were those of a man, his bones fragile and yellowed with age. The shreds of clothing that clung to the corpse told a tale of another century. Scraps of a gray suit, buttons dulled with corrosion, and the detritus of a life now forgotten. Among the scattered remnants were artifacts that bespoke the man's identity. A stickpin of archaic design, shoes with soles curling from decay, and a badge bearing the name of the Providence Telegram. In the crumbling leather of a pocketbook he found further clues. A handful of outdated banknotes. A brittle celluloid calendar marked with the year 1893, and calling cards that bore the name... Edwin M. Lillibridge. Blake's hands shook as he unfolded a sheet of yellowed paper found within the wallet. Its surface bore scrawled notations in a hurried, uneven hand. He moved to the westward window, where the dim light afforded him just enough clarity to make out the script. The phrases leapt at him in their disjointed, fragmented nature, the words heavy with dread and laden with cryptic import. The notes on the brittle page unfolded a history steeped in dread, the scrawled words seeming to pulse with the weight of their implications. Blake read each fragment carefully, the disjointed sentences coalescing into a narrative of darkness and decline. Professor Enoch Bowen, home from Egypt, May 1844, buys old Free Will Church in July, his archaeological work and studies in a cult well-known. A man returned from the tomb-shadowed sands of Egypt, his hands clutching secrets that should never have crossed the threshold of the Nile. His purchase of the church marked the beginning, though none then could have foreseen what would follow. 
Dr. Drown of Fourth Baptist warns against starry wisdom in Sermon Deck 29, 1844. Already the murmurs had begun, the warnings from the righteous against this burgeoning congregation of the damned. The starry wisdom, they called it, a name heavy with cosmic portents. Congregation 97 by end of 45. The numbers swelled as moths to a flame, the curious and the reckless drawn by whispers of hidden truths and celestial wonders. 1846. Three disappearances. First mention of shining trapezohedron. The first vanishings marked the change, the moment when the church turned inward upon itself, its secrets no longer confined to books and murmured rites. The name of the shining trapezohedron appeared, a talisman of unspeakable origin. Seven disappearances, 1848. Stories of blood sacrifice begin. The rites grew darker. The sacrifices began, staining the church with blood and rumor, its walls resounding with the echo of horrors that dared not face the light. Investigation 1853 comes to nothing. Stories of sounds. The city stirred uneasily, but its efforts faltered. Investigators found only silence, though the tales of strange noises, whispers, cries, and worse, persisted. Foctor O'Malley tells of devil worship with box found in great Egyptian ruins. Says they call up something that can't exist in light. Flees a little light and banished by strong light. Then has to be summoned again. Probably got this from deathbed confession of Francis X. Feeney, who had joined Starry Wisdom in 49. These people say the shining trapezohedron shows them heaven and other worlds and that the haunter of the dark tells them secrets in some way. The priest's words painted a picture of blasphemy beyond reckoning. The trapezohedron was no mere artifact, but a gateway to visions, other worlds, other beings, and the haunter of the dark, a presence drawn forth to whisper its alien truths. Story of Oren B. Eddy, 1857. They call it up by gazing at the crystal and have a secret language of their own. A language apart, the signs and utterances of those who gaze too deeply. The haunter came at their call, summoned from realms beyond the comprehension of sane men. Two hundred or more in Congo, 1863, exclusive of men at front. Even war could not sever the church's hold. Its influence deepened, its congregation bloated with those who sought more than mere salvation. Irish boys mob church in 1869 after Patrick Regan's disappearance. The blood price of the starry wisdom drew its victims indiscriminately, and the anger of the bereaved boiled into action. The mob came, though their efforts did little to break the darkness within. Veiled article in J. March 14th, 72, but people don't talk about it. The press took note, though in whispers and riddles. By then, silence had become a shield against the church's horrors. Six Disappearances, 1876. Secret Committee Calls on Mayor Doyle. Desperation mounted. The disappearances continued, each one a thread unraveling the city's uneasy peace. Action promised Febino, 1877. Church closes in April. The end came, not with a bang, but with a slow cessation. The congregation melted away, and the doors of the church shut, its secrets entombed. Gang, Federal Hill boys, threaten Dr. M and vestrymen in May. The threats lingered, a shadow of the violence that might yet erupt. 181 persons leave city before end of 77. Mention no names. Exodus. A scattering of lives as though pursued by an invisible hand. Ghost stories begin around 1880. Try to ascertain truth of report 
that no human being has entered church since 1877. The stories began born of silence and shadow. The church, empty but alive with its unseen weight, grew into a thing of legend. Ask Lanigan for photograph of place taken 1851. Blake folded the paper and placed it carefully back into the tattered pocketbook. His eyes fell again to the bones in the dust, the remains of Edwin M. Lillibridge. The story written in the yellowed fragments was clear enough. Lillibridge had come here seeking a tale that no other reporter dared to claim, chasing the shadow of something monstrous. But he had not returned. Blake knelt over the skeleton, his gaze lingering on the peculiar state of the remains. The bones were scattered, some ends dissolved into jagged irregularity. Others bore a charred appearance, as though some consuming fire or corrosive acid had licked at them. The skull was the most disturbing, stained a strange, sickly yellow, and marked by a blackened hole at its apex, as if the bone had been bored through by some chemical force too terrible to imagine. For forty years these remains had lingered here, their story untold. Blake rose, the shadows of the chamber thickening around him, and felt the growing weight of the church's silence, its mysteries pressing against the edge of his reason, like a tide creeping ever inward. Blake found himself once more before the stone, its strange geometries exerting a pull that seemed almost alive. The object drew his gaze with an insistence that transcended reason, and as he stared into its fasted depths, visions unfurled in his mind like a dream spilling from some unseen reservoir. Processions moved across his inner sight, their figures hooded and robed, their forms distinctly not of mankind. He beheld deserts without end, their horizons broken by towering monoliths whose carvings reached skyward in dreadful symmetry. His mind drifted to towers and walls submerged in the black stillness of the sea, their cold stones cloaked in eternal shadow. He glimpsed the churn of vortices in the void, where veils of black mist twisted against faint glimmers of a purple haze, cold and unnatural. But most harrowing of all was the gulf, an endless abyss where darkness itself seemed alive, solid and semi-solid forms stirring faintly in its depths. There chaos reigned, yet bore the marks of some greater order, a cloudy lattice of force imposing fleeting coherence upon the void. In that moment he felt he brushed against the boundaries of ultimate understanding, the paradoxes and mysteries of creation tantalizingly near. Then the vision broke, shattered by a sudden and inexplicable wave of panic that clenched at his chest and throat. Blake staggered back, choking as a formless dread coiled about him. It was not the stone itself, he realized, but something that had looked through it, something that had seen him even as he saw it. The cognition was not sight, not anything physical, but a knowledge that pierced him like an unseen spear. He turned from the stone, its spell shattered, yet felt as though he had been irrevocably entangled with the presence behind it. A sense of malign watchfulness pressed upon him, and he knew that whatever had peered through the artifact would not relent. The light in the room had grown faint, the coming twilight pooling in the corners of the chamber, and Blake was suddenly aware of how unprepared he was. He carried no torch, no lantern, nothing to hold back the deepening dark. He resolved to leave, yet even as he turned to go, a faint luminosity caught his eye. He looked back at the stone, drawn by a compulsion he could neither name nor resist. The object glimmered faintly, as if imbued with a soft, phosphorescent glow. Was it some property of the mineral, a radioactive luminescence? 
or was it something far stranger? The name returned to him from the dead man's notes, Shining Trapezohedron. Blake shivered as questions pressed upon him. What had truly transpired in this forsaken church, abandoned to shadow and decay? What had been called forth, and what might yet linger here, cloaked in the gloom of its bird-shunned walls? A faint, sickly odor seemed to rise in the chamber, its source unknown yet oppressive. It was a stench that hinted at decay, at wrongness, at something other than life. With shaking hands, Blake seized the hinged lid of the alien box and snapped it shut, the metal moving smoothly despite its alien age. The glow vanished with a finality that was almost audible, and the click of the lid echoed like a pronouncement. Then, from above, came a sound, a faint stirring, soft yet laden with menace. Blake froze, his breath shallow as his ears strained to discern its source. It came from the steeple, from the black void beyond the trap door. He told himself it was rats. What else could stir in such a place? Yet the sound carried with it a horror that defied such explanations, an unspoken weight that sent him reeling. Panic seized him fully now, and he fled, his steps quickened by a fear he could not name. Down the spiral stairs he plunged, the cobwebbed nave stretching like a vast mausoleum around him as he ran. The shadows of the basement closed upon him, and then he was outside, gasping in the cool dusk of the square. The streets of Federal Hill stretched before him, narrow and crooked, yet he traversed them with reckless speed, the teeming life of the quarter seeming to press and suffocate him. At last he reached the familiar brick sidewalks of the college district, their quiet order a balm against the chaos from which he had fled. In the days that followed, Blake told no one of his expedition. The memory of the stone, the skeleton, and the oppressive dark clung to him like a shroud. Instead, he buried himself in study. He read feverishly, seeking answers in the shadowed tomes of his own library and the newspaper archives downtown. The cryptogram from the vestry room demanded his attention, its cipher complex and unyielding. Blake worked tirelessly, testing its patterns against every tongue he knew, Latin, Greek, French, and German among them, but the code resisted all interpretation. It was not a language known to mortal men, and Blake began to suspect that he would need to delve into the deepest recesses of his occult knowledge to uncover its secrets. Each evening, Blake felt the old compulsion rise anew, his gaze drawn westward to the distant spire that had haunted his thoughts since that fateful day. Yet now the sight brought with it a deeper and more intimate dread, for he knew the evil it harbored the lore it veiled beneath its gaunt shadow. The knowledge transformed his vision, casting new shapes upon the steeple, shapes that writhed and shifted like phantoms upon the edge of perception. The birds of spring, those harbingers of renewal, wheeled across the sky in their sunset migrations, but their flight betrayed an uncanny reluctance. They veered sharply away from the spire, their movements disordered and frantic, and though Blake could not hear their cries, he imagined their frantic twittering as they fled. By June, Blake's diary recorded his triumph over the cryptogram. The language he discovered was Aklo, a sinister and ancient tongue spoken by cults of unspeakable antiquity. His earlier studies had granted him only a halting grasp of it, but it sufficed. The diary gave few details of what he had deciphered, but its tone betrayed awe and disquiet. He wrote of the haunter of the dark, a being summoned through the shining trapezohedron, and of its connection to the vast, chaotic gulfs from which it had emerged. The entity, he learned, held knowledge beyond human reckoning, but demanded sacrifices of a monstrous nature. Blake seemed increasingly convinced that the being had been awakened, 
its presence stirring within the steeple's eternal gloom. Yet he clung to the belief that the streetlights surrounding Federal Hill formed a barrier the creature could not cross. Of the trapezohedron itself, his diary spoke often and obsessively. He called it a window on all time and space, tracing its history through a lineage both arcane and appalling. Fashioned on Yugath in ions, beyond reckoning, it had been brought to Earth by the Old Ones, passing into the care of the crinoid beings of Antarctica, who preserved it in its strange box. From there it was unearthed by the serpent men of Valusia, studied by the first humans of Lemuria, and later carried across the seas by the survivors of Atlantis. A Minoan fisherman had dredged it from the depths, selling it to merchants bound for Egypt, where Pharaoh Nephren Ka built a windowless temple around it. There, in the darkness, he performed rites so blasphemous that his name was stricken from history. When the temple was raised, the trapezohedron was buried, only to be unearthed again by Delvers, who unwittingly loosed its curse upon the world. By July, Blake's diary began to align disturbingly with reports from Federal Hill. The newspapers, though brief and dismissive, hinted at a growing unease among the Italians who lived near the church. They whispered of sounds, scrapings, bumpings, stirrings in the steeple, and called upon their priests to intervene. The horror that haunted the steeple had entered their dreams, its presence felt as a malign watcher poised at the threshold of darkness, waiting. The press, while acknowledging the long-standing superstitions, failed to grasp the depth of the terror. The young reporters, Blake lamented, were no antiquarians. Blake's own writings grew darker, tinged with remorse and foreboding. He spoke of the duty to bury the shining trapezohedron, to let sunlight pierce the steeple and banish what had been called forth. Yet his fascination with the object proved a dangerous snare. Even as he resolved to seal it away, he confessed to a morbid longing. To climb the accursed tower once more. To gaze again into the unearthly glow of the stone and drink from its cosmic revelations. On the morning of July the 17th, the journal carried a small piece that sent Blake into a frenzy of terror. It was one of the paper's half-mocking notes about the unease on Federal Hill, but to him it carried a weight of dreadful significance. A thunderstorm during the night had plunged the city into darkness. The street lamps extinguished for an hour. In that black interval, the Italians had descended into near madness. Those living closest to the church swore that the entity within the steeple had stirred, seizing its chance to move. The descriptions were chilling, a flopping, viscous thing that descended from the steeple into the nave, its movements accompanied by dreadful sounds that echoed through the hollow church. Toward the end of the hour, it had returned to the tower, where glass shattered in the darkness. The creature, they said, could move wherever shadows reigned, but light would always drive it back. Blake read and reread the account, his mind alight with dread and speculation. The thing in the steeple was no longer confined, its forays into the church marking a sinister new chapter in its awakening. The light might hold it at bay for now, but Blake could not escape the sense that the fragile bulwark was crumbling, that the darkness would soon spill forth unrestrained. And in his heart, a terrible certainty grew. The creature had seen him, marked him as its own, and would not rest until its shadow enveloped him entirely. When the city's lights flared back to life, the creature in the church reacted with a fury that resounded through the tower. Even the dim shafts of light slipping through the grime-blackened louver boards were too much for it, and it fled upward with a slithering desperation, retreating to the tenebrous heights of the steeple. 
a longer exposure to that feeble radiance would have driven it back to the abyss from which Blake's reckless curiosity had summoned it. For an hour, in that interval of total darkness, the city had trembled beneath the weight of something unseen and unspeakable. Crowds had gathered in the rain outside the church, their candles and lamps shielded against the downpour by umbrellas and paper folds, their light forming a makeshift bulwark against the nightmare that prowled in the dark. Some swore they heard the great outer door rattle, though none dared approach to see what sought escape. Yet the worst was yet to come. That evening, as Blake scanned the pages of the bulletin, his unease deepened. Reporters, lured by the morbid curiosity of the age, had braved the warnings of the terrified Italians and entered the church through the cellar window, finding its doors securely locked. What they discovered within confirmed every whisper of fear that had clung to the place. The dust of the nave and vestibule had been churned into chaotic swirls, as though something monstrous had crawled and flopped through its shadowed spaces. Fragments of rotted pew cushions and satin linings were scattered about, mingled with patches of yellowish stains and strange, charred marks. The air hung heavy with a foul odor, one that lingered even as the reporters ascended to the tower. In the tower room, they found much as Blake himself had left it. The heptagonal stone pillar the overturned Gothic chairs, the towering plaster effigies. Yet two details sent a cold finger of dread through Blake as he read. First, the reporters made no mention of the shining trapezohedron, the metal box, or the skeletal remains. These, it seemed, had vanished. Second, the windows of the tower had all been shattered, their jagged remnants stuffed with pew linings and horsehair in what appeared to be a frantic attempt to restore the chamber's impenetrable darkness. The reporters theorized hoaxes or the macabre pranks of superstitious locals, but their accounts could not mask the deeper truth. Something had been disturbed, something that shunned even the faintest light. Worse still were the details of the spire above. The ladder leading to the trap door bore the same yellow stains and charred markings as the nave. And when one reporter climbed to the summit, the fetid darkness greeted him with shapeless fragments scattered near the aperture. His flashlight pierced the gloom, but revealed nothing comprehensible, only the remnants of something too alien to define. Blake's diary, from this point onward, took a darker, and more frantic tone. The horror weighed on him like a stone, driving him to frenzied speculation and bouts of self-recrimination. He berated himself for his inaction, for failing to undo what he had set in motion. The thought of another blackout haunted him, the power outage that could come again with the next storm, stripping the city of its fragile protections. He telephoned the electric light company on three occasions, his voice frantic as he implored them to guard against another lapse in power. Yet his fears were not limited to the steeple's secrets. The disappearance of the box, the trapezohedron, and the skeleton filled him with gnawing dread. He wondered who or what might have removed them, and to what end. But above all, it was the connection between himself and the thing he had awakened that gnawed at his sanity. He wrote again and again of the rapport he felt, a terrible link that seemed to stretch across space and time, binding his mind to the horror in the steeple. Callers of the period remarked on his abstraction, the way he would sit for hours at his desk, his gaze fixed on the westward window. Beyond the swirling smoke of the city's chimneys, his eyes found the spire bristling mound of Federal Hill, its silhouette stark against the sky. His dreams grew darker, 
his sleep fractured by visions of the thing reaching out to him, whispering to him and drawing him closer. One entry told of a night when he woke suddenly to find himself outdoors, fully dressed and descending College Hill, his feet moving as if by another's will. Again and again, he returned to the same chilling refrain. The thing in the steeple knew where to find him. Its presence weighed upon him always, a shadow at the edge of thought, a force tugging at his will. Whatever he had summoned, he knew it would not rest until its darkness consumed him entirely. The week following July 30th marked Blake's descent into a dark, fractured state of mind. He withdrew entirely, ceasing even the simplest routines of daily life. He no longer dressed, confined himself to his home, and ordered his meals by telephone, speaking in clipped, distracted tones. Visitors who dared approach noted with unease the lengths of cord he kept beside his bed. Blake explained almost absently that sleepwalking had plagued him, an affliction so severe he was forced to bind his ankles nightly, trusting the knots to hold or to wake him as he struggled against them. His diary revealed the catalyst of his collapse. On the night of July 30th, he had retired uneasily, his nerves already worn thin. Sleep, when it came, brought no peace but a waking nightmare. He found himself wandering through a nearly lightless void, the air thick with a reeking feeder that turned his stomach. Above him he heard furtive sounds, a soft jumble of movements, accompanied by the faint sliding of wood against wood. Dim, horizontal streaks of bluish light hung in the darkness, their origins unknowable. Stumbling blindly, his hands found a pillar of stone with a vacant top, and he recoiled at its cold, unyielding presence. Moments later, his fingers brushed the rungs of a ladder affixed to a wall, and he began to climb, drawn upward toward a place where the stench grew hotter, more suffocating. As he ascended, his vision swam with kaleidoscopic images that coalesced, dissolved, and returned, their shapes maddening and alien. Then the visions gave way to a greater horror, the vast and yawning abyss of ultimate chaos, where no light shone and where suns and worlds of blackness spun in an endless void. His thoughts turned to ancient whispers of Azathoth, the blind idiot god at the universe's heart, encircled by its flopping amorphous courtiers and lulled by the thin, monotonous piping of an infernal flute. A sudden noise, sharp and distinct, shattered the spell. Blake could never say what it was, perhaps a distant echo of fireworks, for such sounds were common in the summer as Federal Hill's inhabitants celebrated their saints. Whatever its source, it broke the dream's hold, plunging him into raw, unutterable terror. He screamed, his voice echoing through the dark, and released his grip on the ladder. Falling clumsily, he scrambled across the debris-strewn floor, his every movement fraught with panic. He knew instantly where he was, back in the terrible tower chamber, and his mind reeled at the implications. Blindly, he fled. Down the narrow, spiraling stairs he went, his body bruised and battered as he stumbled against the ancient stone. The nave was a nightmare its great cobwebbed arches looming above him like the twisted ribs of a vast beast, the shadows leering from every corner. He raced through the littered basement, clawed his way to the surface, and burst into the open air. The city stretched before him, spectral and oppressive, its towers black against the dim light of the street lamps. He fled eastward, past grim facades and silent gables, his breath ragged and his limbs trembling. Only when he reached the ancient door of his own home did he collapse. Morning found him sprawled on the floor of his study, fully dressed and covered in grime. 
His body was a map of aches and bruises, each movement a fresh reminder of the night's horrors. Rising shakily, he caught sight of himself in the mirror and recoiled. His hair was scorched, blackened at the tips as if by fire, and a faint unclean odor clung to his clothes. That scent, sickly and alien, seemed a parting gift from whatever he had encountered. His nerves gave way entirely. From then on, Blake drifted through his days in a haze of exhaustion, clad in a dressing gown and sinking ever deeper into despair. He rarely moved from his westward window, where he stared at the mound of Federal Hill and its sinister steeple. Thunderstorms became a particular terror. At the first distant rumble, he would shiver and retreat further into himself, scribbling incoherent entries in his diary. The great storm of August 8th arrived with terrifying force. The heavens cracked open just before midnight, and lightning fell like vengeful spears across the city. Torrents of rain lashed the streets, while thunder rolled unceasingly, shaking windows and driving sleep from countless homes. Blake, already frantic, grew nearly deranged when the storm disrupted the city's lighting system. At 1 a.m., consumed by dread, he attempted to telephone the electric company but the lines had been cut for safety. His diary from that night became a record of escalating terror. The writing was erratic and barely legible. The letters scrawled with such desperation that their meaning was often lost. The hieroglyphs he etched in the dark told of a mind unraveling, of a soul caught in the grip of something vast, implacable, and utterly malignant. Blake sat in his darkened study, his desk a lonely island in a sea of shadows. He kept the room unlit so his eyes could fix on the distant constellation of lights marking Federal Hill, their glimmering points scattered across the rain-slick rooftops of the city. The storm beat against the glass, but he barely noticed. All his attention was locked westward toward the mound and its terrible spire. At times, his trembling hand found the diary before him, and he scrawled disjointed phrases that bore the weight of his dread. The lights must not go. It knows where I am. I must destroy it. It is calling to me, but perhaps it means no injury this time. These cryptic sentences littered the pages like warnings from a mind unraveling. Then at 2 on 12 a.m., the city's lights failed. The grid faltered, plunging Providence into a sudden, suffocating darkness. At the powerhouse, records would later confirm the exact moment. But Blake's diary contained only a single, stark entry. Lights out. God help me. On Federal Hill, the watchers stirred uneasily. Rain-soaked clusters of men roamed the alleys and circled the church's high walls, their meager lights faltering against the storm. They carried candles shielded by umbrellas, oil lanterns, electric torches, and charms of every description. Crucifixes, amulets, and talismans drawn from their old world traditions. Each flash of lightning was a momentary reprieve, and they crossed themselves and murmured blessings with every jagged burst. But the storm's rhythm shifted. The flashes grew less frequent and then ceased altogether. The blackness deepened, oppressive and absolute. The rising wind extinguished most of the candles, leaving the square to sink further into shadow. Someone had roused Father Merluzzo, the priest of Spirito Santo, and his hurried arrival brought a brief sense of purpose to the terrified crowd. He stood in the rain, reciting prayers and blessings in a steady, solemn voice, but his words seemed to vanish into the choking dark. Overhead, from the shrouded tower, came the restless sounds of movement, soft and furtive, yet unmistakably real.
At 2.35 a.m., the watchers bore witness to something no rational mind could easily frame. The testimony of Father Merluzzo, Patrolman William J. Monahan, and 78 other men present in the square forms the fractured record of those moments. There was, of course, nothing overtly supernatural in what they described. A skeptic might point to the natural processes of decay, to chemical reactions born of rot and ruin, or to the deliberate mischief of men with too much imagination and too little restraint. Yet the event remains a thing of terror. The first sign was a swelling of the strange, fumbling sounds within the tower, louder now and urgent in their tempo. Alongside this came a sharp intensification of the foul odor that had seeped intermittently from the church. It grew stronger, more noxious, clinging to the air like a physical presence. Then came the splintering crack of wood, violent and final, and the sound of something heavy crashing down into the yard east of the church. Those who could still see through the dark recognized it for what it was, the louver-boarded east window of the tower, torn free and hurled to the ground. But the broken window was only the beginning. From the unseen heights of the tower erupted a wave of stench so vile that it overwhelmed the crowd, driving some to their knees. It was the stink of decay magnified a hundredfold, as if the bowels of the earth had opened to disgorge the rot of ages. Many wretched where they stood, clutching at their throats and pressing their hands to their faces in a futile effort to block the smell. At the same moment, the air quivered with an unearthly vibration, a deep rhythmic beat like the flapping of monstrous wings. It grew louder, more insistent, until a sudden blast of wind tore through the square, snatching away hats and ripping umbrellas from desperate hands. The gale howled eastward, its force unmatched by any prior gust, as if driven by some vast and unseen power. Some in the crowd, craning their necks upward, claimed to see a shape against the night. It was no form they could name, only a vast blot of darkness that seemed to shift and expand, its edges amorphous and billowing like smoke. It moved with unnatural speed, streaking eastward like a meteor and vanishing into the unseen void beyond the city's skyline. Whatever it was, it left behind only silence and the still reeking ruins of the church. The watchers remained, trembling and mute, unable to give voice to what they had witnessed. Father Merluzzo lowered his head, muttering quiet prayers, while the others exchanged glances of fear and disbelief. The storm raged on, but the square had grown strangely quiet, as if holding its breath. And above, in the blackened steeple, no sound could be heard. That was all. The watchers remained rooted to the sodden ground, half paralyzed by a mingling of fear, awe, and discomfort. They didn't know what had transpired, nor whether they should act at all. And so they stayed, their vigil unbroken, until a sharp bolt of belated lightning ripped through the sky. The flash illuminated the drenched square with an eerie brilliance, and the deafening clap of thunder that followed seemed to shake the heavens themselves. A prayer went up from trembling lips, though whether in gratitude or supplication none could have said. The rain ceased half an hour later, and the watchers, bedraggled and weary, stood uncertain in the newfound quiet. When the streetlights flickered back to life fifteen minutes after, their return sent a wave of relief through the soaked and shivering crowd. Slowly, hesitantly, the men began to disperse, each retreating to his home and the fragile safety of familiar walls. The next day's papers made only a passing mention of these events, folded into the larger narrative of the storm that had ravaged the city. 
The great flash of lightning and thunderous report over Federal Hill were noted. But it was the phenomena to the east, over College Hill, that drew the most attention. There, the atmospheric violence had been even more extreme, accompanied by the same strange and intolerable stench that had plagued the church. Witnesses on the hill described a singular burst of light, its source elusive, and an upward gust of wind so violent it stripped the leaves from trees and left gardens blighted in its wake. Speculation ran rampant, though no trace of a lightning strike could be found. A handful of early risers, or sleepless souls, reported glimpsing something else, something fleeting and grotesque. One young man, watching from a window in the Tau Omega fraternity house, claimed to see a hideous mass of smoke writhing in the air as the flash illuminated the night. His account, though unverifiable, was corroborated in part by others who noted a spreading darkness, a presence more felt than seen, and the acrid, burning smell that lingered long after. The events on College Hill became intertwined with a grimmer discovery that morning. The death of Robert Blake. It was students in the Psi Delta house overlooking Blake's study who first sensed something was wrong. They had noticed him at his westward window earlier that day, his face pale and oddly fixed. When the same figure sat unmoving as twilight descended, they grew concerned. No lights came on in his apartment, and by evening their unease compelled them to act. The students rang the bell to no answer, and a call to the police brought an officer who forced open the door. Inside they found Blake's body seated rigidly at the desk, his lifeless gaze fixed on the dark horizon beyond the window. His face was a mask of twisted horror, the glassy eyes bulging and the features frozen in a rictus of unspeakable fear. The sight was too much for those present, and they turned away in sickened dread. The coroner's examination was swift and pragmatic. Though the window had remained unbroken, the official report concluded that electrical shock or extreme nervous tension induced by the storm's discharge had caused Blake's death. The grotesque expression on his face was dismissed as an effect of his abnormal imagination and neurotic tendencies. Judgments drawn from the books and papers scattered about his study. The final jottings in his diary, blind and frenzied scrawls made with a pencil clutched in his death-stiffened hand, were noted as evidence of his deteriorated mental state. Those jottings, though fragmented and nearly illegible, were the subject of intense scrutiny. They offered only partial coherence, yet certain investigators found in them a narrative that defied the materialistic conclusions of, of the official report. Blake's words hinted at the presence of something vast and malevolent, a force he believed had found him through the shining trapezohedron, a window into dark and alien gulfs. Some speculated that his notes described the return of the haunter of the dark, a being summoned by the stone's malignant glow and bound to Blake through their terrible, unholy rapport. Yet these theories gained little traction, dismissed as the ravings of occult-minded eccentrics. The strange actions of Dr. Dexter, who retrieved the trapezohedron, and cast it into the deepest waters of Narragansett Bay, further fueled skepticism. To the conservative mind, this destruction of evidence suggested superstition rather than science, though those who knew the doctor whispered that his reasons were born of fear, not folly. The diary's fragmented entries remain grim and haunted, the final words of a man ensnared by something beyond the grasp of human understanding. These are all that can be deciphered. The final scrawls in Blake's diary form a fragmented descent into terror, a mind unraveling as it grappled with forces beyond comprehension. The words, blind and uneven, spoke of dread not bound by the physical. 
of perceptions twisted and redefined by an encroaching presence that consumed him even as he wrote. Light's still out. Must be five minutes now. Everything depends on lightning. Yadith grant it will keep up. Some influence seems beating through it. Rain and thunder and wind deafen. The thing is taking hold of my mind. The power outage stretched on, the storm raging outside, and Blake's hopes pinned themselves to the erratic flashes of lightning. Yet even that elemental light seemed tainted, its bursts no longer purely natural, but vessels for something invasive. He wrote of a force pressing against his thoughts, something unseen yet undeniable. Trouble with memory. I see things I never knew before. Other worlds and other galaxies. Dark. The lightning seems dark, and the darkness seems light. Blake's perception splintered, reality dissolving beneath the weight of alien truths. Images of distant worlds and unfamiliar stars filled his mind. Places he had never known, yet somehow remembered. The storm outside blurred into a paradoxical inversion, lightning becoming shadow, and the encroaching darkness alive with blinding clarity. It cannot be the real hill and church that I see in the pitch darkness. Must be retinal impression left by flashes. Heaven grant the Italians are out with their candles if the lightning stops. He clung to the thought of the watchers on Federal Hill, their trembling lights a fragile defense against the horror in the steeple. Yet he doubted what he saw, questioning whether the hill and its dreadful spire existed outside his own mind. What am I afraid of? Is it not an avatar of Nyarlathotep, who in antique and shadowy chem even took the form of man? I remember Yugoth and more distant Shagai, and the ultimate void of the black planets. Blake's thoughts turned to the lore he had uncovered, to the cosmic pantheon of malign intelligences. The name Nyarlathotep rose unbidden, and with it came the weight of history and myth, of ancient Chem and the deities who once walked as men. And then, unbidden, came memories of Yugoth, Shagai, and the Black Planets, places he had never been but now knew intimately. The long winging flight through the void cannot cross the universe of light, recreated by the thoughts caught in the shining trapezohedron. Send it through the horrible abysses of radiance. His words veered into madness, describing impossible journeys through voids and gulfs, the shining trapezohedron acting as both vessel and snare. The light itself, that which mankind clings to for salvation, became a paradox, both barrier and gateway to unspeakable abysses. My name is Blake, Robert Harrison Blake, of 620 East Knapp Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am on this planet. Desperation struck, his words an anchor to reality. He repeated his name, his address, affirming his place on earth as if to combat the pull of something that sought to unmake him. Azathoth, have mercy! The lightning no longer flashes. Horrible. I can see everything with a monstrous sense that is not sight. Light is dark, and dark is light. Those people on the hill, guard, candles, and charms. They're priests. The darkness became complete and with it came a new form of vision, a perception not bound by the eyes, a monstrous awareness that swallowed distances and upended reason. The watchers and their futile lights lingered in his mind, their prayers and charms a frail bastion against the abyss. Sense of distance gone, far is near and near is far. No light, no glass, see that steeple, that tower, window, can hear. Roderick Usher, am mad or going mad? The thing is stirring and fumbling in the tower. 
I am it, and it is I. I want to get out, must get out and unify the forces. It knows where I am. Blake's identity fractured further, the boundaries between himself and the entity dissolving. The haunter of the dark stirred, its fumblings in the steeple echoing through his mind. He wrote of unity, of forces converging, and of a terrifying awareness that the thing not only knew him, but was becoming him. I am Robert Blake, but I see the tower in the dark. There is a monstrous odor, senses transfigured, boarding at that tower window, cracking and giving way. I, Ngai, Ig. The window, that frail barrier of wood and glass, was failing. His words descended into alien syllables, the language of his tormentor spilling through his mind and onto the page. I see it, coming here, hell wind, titan blur, black wings. Yog sothoth save me, the three-lobed burning eye. The end came in a crescendo of horror. The thing left the steeple, its vast black wings cutting through the night, carried on a wind born of the void. The three-lobed burning eye pierced him, its gaze erasing the last of his reason. Blake's words stopped, the pencil breaking in his spasming hand, and silence reclaimed the room.